So now I want to go through rather quickly a series of projects organized thematically. Um, the first is under the theme of Simply Supported. And this is really examples of engineering uh, where the direct diagrammatic representation of what's going on structural, structurally, sometimes playful, is the contribution that, that the engineering could make to the design. This is a project, um, one of the first projects I worked on with Steve Hall, um, the Gedenkbibliothek in Berlin, a wonderful um, lyrical project that unfortunately didn't get built, but that we were all working on together just before the wall came down. So I think the project brought the walls down even if it didn't get built. Um, so these nine projects, um, and I'll move through this fairly quickly, but I think represent this idea over the last number of years that I've been working of this use of the structure as a kind of spatial diagram, um, not just in terms of the tectonics, but in terms of a kind of tracery, maybe a gothic approach to the, the, um, the way it can contribute to the space. The next project with Lloyd Hawkinson and Henry Smith Miller, as well as Barbara Kruger and uh, Nicholas Quinnell, was a uh, project we did in North Carolina. And this um, involved a lot of different elements, but one was this, this, this structure for this overhead canopy. And this was really representing a notion of simply supported. On one side, a connection to these trusses that prevented motion in a particular direction, and another one that released motion in another direction. So to an engineer looking at this and reading this, it clearly represents in an almost cartoonish way what simply supported mean. And I think for me that was um, fun and, and part of the playful attitude of that particular project. Similarly, the Santa Fe Opera House, which I um, worked on with Jim Polchek, um, we had to deal with the uh, the fact that the building was, that the, the new roof was being built on existing columns which we wanted to reuse, so we had to figure out a way to make it larger and lighter at the same time. So we came up, um, and I remember waking up in the middle of the night thinking of this sort of three-dimensional thing that would reach out from those columns and hold up these, these steel um, uh, inverted T members that would in turn hold up a wood roof that would also serve as an acoustical surface. So the multi use aspect of this as well um, was important. And um, this, this is the final surface. So these are wood planks that span between these, um, these steel members and, and act as well for the acoustics of the, of the space. It's worked out really well um, and uh, I think has a great presence in that, in that location. Also with Stephen, the structure for the Nelson Atkins Museum um, project with Stephen and, and Chris McVoy. Uh, there, the idea with the lenses, these glass volumes that make up the, um, uh, a, a series of pavilions and light sources for the museum spaces, we came up with the idea of having the structure always in the middle. Um, in some cases, um, these were these T's that came up and, and cantilevered out so that the glass all the way around this would be as transparent as possible, uninterrupted by um, structural members. So a very clear diagram, kind of like the mast of a ship reaching out and being stayed on the outside for, for stability. In this case, I think working well with the transparency. With Harry Cobb, a competition um, a couple years ago that we did together, was also very much about the direct visible expression of the structural um, uh, behavior. This was a courtyard cover for the Patent Office building. It's a competition that Norman Foster won and did, I think, a rather beautiful job um, with our scheme, this sort of bubbling cauldron of structural um, forces was directly uh, related to the moment diagram that you get if you prop something like a, this on the four-legged um, supports that we had underneath. Now, originally in this courtyard, there were these two trees, and our idea was that we would create the same kind of spatial relationship that existed from the trees by placing these um, tetrapods as means of support and then tying them down on the side. So again, a little bit like a mass structure with the compression in the middle and the tension on the outside. But then as you can see in the diagram on the left, with that system, 
the eight support points create, and if you put a two-way grid on top of that, you get a two-way moment diagram that is that yellow and red um, diagram up there. If you run a series of pipes along those shapes in both directions and then put cables in those pipes and then yank the whole thing um, in tension, you're basically doing a kind of visible pre-stressed system, what you would not otherwise not see inside a pre-stressed slab, um, and that would then balance the dead weight of this um, surface and keep everything flat. So it was a, the representation of that, of that idea um, in, in direct um, diagrammatic form. With Francois de Menil, um, worked on this fresco chapel down in Houston at the Menil um, Museum. This was a uh, project to give a home to two frescoes that had been stolen in, in, um, in Cyprus and were recovered in Germany and brought to Houston and were on loan for many years, 15 years actually, in Houston. And the notion here was to suspend them in a glass um, recreation of the chapel that they had been in, in in northern Cyprus by using a series of rods, these are steel, three quarter inch diameter steel rods that are pulled in tension between the roof and the floor structure. There are springs on the top um, so that when the roof deflects it doesn't reduce the amount of tension in these rods but the tension is um, there to make sure that the rods under whatever load configuration might happen to them don't ever go into compression. So it's a kind of, of spider web of these rods within which are, are placed these annealed glass panels. The panels were sandblasted, annealed, and laminated. They were not tempered. So we had to also come up with little clip details um, that were uh, able to grab the edges of them because we couldn't bolt through since it was annealed glass. Um, it had a 15-year life and was recently dismantled. Um, we have a few pieces of this glass in storage, if anybody's interested. Um, the frescoes went back to, uh, to um, Cyprus and the project was, was taken apart. And the Menil is um, still, I think, working on trying to figure out how to uh, adapt this building to another, to another use. Um, working with Richard Meyer on the church in Rome, um, with the help of a number of engineers in Rome, was able to convince everybody that we should make this in a very Roman way out of solid blocks of concrete stacked up to make each of these um, uh, walls. They're, they're spherical, they're all cut from the same sphere, which is a, uh, a reference to the Sydney Opera House, the way in which that was eventually rationalized by Peter Rice, among others. And then um, sliced into two meters square by 80 centimeter thick panels that were all prefabricated off site and then stacked together using this fantastic giant gantry called La Machina, which um, lumbered back and forth for several years, installing these blocks at a very steady but slow pace, one block in the morning, lunch, one block at night, in the afternoon, coffee, which worked out well for those of us who enjoyed going to Rome to um, visit the construction site. And I think also for the, for the neighbors around this, it's in, a, it's in a residential district on the outskirts of Rome, a lot of kids grew up watching this big machine moving back and forth, placing one block after another, and I think it must have had an effect. Concluding then, I want to look at um, three uh, projects that have been recently completed or under construction. Um, this is a column in a house we're doing with um, Michael Malson where we did this great little twist. It's a, it's a turnaround in the <clears throat> for the garage, so you know, you know which way you're supposed to turn around when you drive in. Um, <clears throat> so this is the Kimball in um, Fort Worth, which was completed recently and got a lot of um, attention. Um, obviously across from Louis Kahn's building and therefore quite um, quite a challenging problem to take on. And one of the, um, here you see in plan, the, the, the basic partie of the, of the project that eventually Piano um, settled on was this pavilion, relatively modest in scale, reflecting 
precisely the geometry of, of Khan's buildings, so the same rhythm as 100, 5 feet, 100, 5 feet, 100. Um, and then behind that, suppressed another part of the program in a part um, that is um, more or less underground. Now, I, I spent a lot of time studying the Kimball and have always been fascinated with lots of the idiosyncrasies about the Kimball. I think one of the great things about it is the way in which Commandant, the engineer, and, and Khan battled over many issues. Um, Commandant was a pretty stubborn man, as was Khan, and so many of the resolutions that ended up in, embedded in the project are the result of a synthesis, um, not always harmonious, between Khan and Commandant's preoccupations. I won't go into great detail, but there's a great deal embedded in this that has to do with the conversation that they had um, with each other. So clearly there had to be something about the new structure of the building across that had um, both internally a similar relationship between structure and, um, and light and also in relationship to, the, um, to, to Louis Kahn's building. The first thing that I, I, I felt was really important and, and um, stated when we were interviewed, we'd never worked before for piano, uh, with piano, uh, was I thought that one of the great features of the Menil, which I love, was the way in which you have the sense of light and dark as the light is filtered through the structure. So it's not the kind of uniform light that you get in some of, of Piano's later projects where there's a very sophisticated layering of structure and scrim that produces the, the, the light that is quite um, beautiful and associated with his work. I thought it would be important in this case to try to figure out a way that there was more strongly, um, the structure was more strongly present and cast a shadow, if you will, as well. So that was one aspect. The other aspect was figuring out a way for the structure to have a presence in relationship to Louis Kahn's building while at the same time being um, uh, having its own character. So that led to the idea of using wood and making these beams span the hundred feet that the vaults of Kahn's building span um, as well. And I'm not sure how effective this idea of light and dark um, ended up, but you definitely get the sense that the structure is a, a, a strong presence, I think, and adds character to the, um, to the spaces. Here, you, the other feature of using wood, the structure goes from the inside to the outside through this glass wall, which was uh, built by Seeley. Also behind, you can see the amazing concrete that the Dotor group did. Um, Dotor is the, is the advocate of slow concrete. Um, I had these wonderful conversations here in New York between him and, and various structural concrete, architectural concrete consultants where he was always advocating for the use, you know, it's basically like the Alice Waters of concrete. I mean, he wanted to use, you know, local ingredients from the river and, and, and you know, grow his own cement in the patch, right? It was, it was, it was a lot of fun. And the end result was fantastic. I mean, I don't, I don't think I've ever seen concrete quite like this. So the, the wood structure goes from the inside to the outside, and one of the virtues of the wood was that it doesn't create a cold bridge. So there were many ways in which wood was beneficial from a, from a um, practical standpoint, but I think also as, as a um, representation of the character. Now, one of the aspects of the structure that um, uh, emerged from the fact that the roof is all glass was that we were trying to, we were going to end up with these double beams. And if you know Piano's work, the idea of doubling is quite common, that we would have these double beams and that the beams would be um, braced in space at their mid um, height, but there would be nothing holding the top because the glass is just sitting on it. And so there's a tendency for these beams to roll over, um, laterally torsional buckling is called, similar to the bridge we did at Yale. And so the challenge here was to figure out a way to hold these together and integrate them with the horizontal bracing in such a way that we prevented that rolling from happening. And that was quite a um, undertaking. We came up with what we call these dog bone um, designs. Um, I think Elizabeth Hodges is in the room who did all the detailing for this. But you can see inside between the beams are these 
plates that are pressed up against it and then bolted through to the other side with these tabs. And what they do is, is force the two beams to roll together as well as work as a kind of Virendale strip that, um, that completes the horizontal truss of the whole system. So we've got a horizontal brace that goes from diagonal bracing to Virendale between the two pieces of wood and the metal, but we also are using that metal to keep the, the two skinny beams. They, these beams are eight inches thick and, and four and a half feet deep, so they're quite big, keeping them from rolling over. So there was a lot of um, uh, detailing and, 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 and refinement in the way these would be put together and, um, and braced with each other. We worked with a fabricator in Canada named Structural Lamb. Turned out there was only one fabricator in North America that could do this. Um, thank goodness we didn't know that at the beginning. And they, they made these glue lambs. They have quite a lot of camber on them because of their span. They started out with the blanks and then they would um, route out the shapes for the metal pieces to, to fit in and the bolts. Very precise, very well done and then um, ship them out. The, the way they shipped them from Canada was great. Basically, the beam is the truck. You put a dolly in the back and a cab in the front, and you just drive off. So um, these guys got from Penticton, British Columbia, to Fort Worth um, that way, wrapped, as you can see, and then lifted into place. Um, the ends is, is a, 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 the sort of the big event structurally. The ends are propped up on these concrete columns. Um, the, the support comes down and goes up in between the beams, so there's really nothing keeping these things from rolling over. What actually is doing the trick are these um, fairly thin tubes. They're solid bars that link, and it's the bending connection between these bars and these as, the, as this pipe goes through that keeps it from rolling over. So to the, to the, to the engineer's eye, this is a pretty tenuous um, undertaking and I can tell you that we spent a great deal of time doing um, innumerable buckling calculations to make sure that we were um, on track. And then we got very worried when large checks started to appear in the wood. Um, it was a mistake in retrospect that these things were wrapped because it trapped the humidity and it created some thermal and, and moisture stresses on the beams, which were not a good idea. In the end, it worked out, but the, the, the torsional stiffness of these things was, was an important aspect. Here you see the detail at the end of how they're, they're supported. The next project um, uh, with Tom Pfeiffer is under construction right now up at Corning. It's actually next to a building that I worked on with Lori Hawkinson and Henry Smither, Miller that you see here in the back. So these are two projects 15 years apart that I um, was involved in. This is a, a museum uh, of glass, part of the complex that Corning has upstate, and a series of galleries that are for the exhibition of objects, so not um, for exhibiting things on the wall, but really for exhibiting things in the space. And the ceiling of this is glass filtered uh, through a structure made of very skinny um, concrete beams. Here you see in, in a series of renderings. Um, clearly uh, alluding to Sphere Fenn's project in, um, in, in Venice at the, at the, at the, at the Biennale grounds. And you can see, I think, with a number of these projects, an interest and preoccupation with this, this, this potential of making very skinny, very deep beams and dealing with the buckling problem that results. So this is um, one of the pieces, a mock-up piece um, up in Canada at BPDL, amazing fabricators um, that made these beams. They're bolted um, at the ends through the hole that you can see here. and um, they make up the structure. They, they're they're three, three inches, three and a half inches thick. Um, so pretty challenging um, cha task for the fabricator to make these and have the concrete be consistent. They've done an amazing job with that and also with the, with the tolerances. These are the, the um, some of them going into place in the last couple of weeks. Um, they're just starting to install them. And I think it's, pretty remarkable the consistency of the concrete they've, they've been able to achieve. On the left are the walls that make up the galleries, and here you see those walls emerging. 
Um, the walls are cavity walls, um, which actually is also the case of the Kimball. Kimball, all the air comes inside the concrete walls um, of the gallery. So the air comes between two layers of concrete and then it's fed in from the top at the Kimball. The Kimball is a little bit challenging because the walls are both also inside the, the perimeter walls, so there has to be insulation and waterproofing stuck inside those cavities, which turned out to be quite challenging. Here the walls are all interior, but the air is coming in between the layers, and you can hit, see here some of the cavity from, from below, and then these are some views from above and below of those cavities. Um, this has worked out quite well. The formwork fits. The dimension turned out to be a good dimension for getting the formwork in and out, and then the ductwork. Um, nice thing about using walls this way is that you're mobilizing the thermal mass. This is also something that turned out to be an advantage on our MIT project. Finally, this is the last project. This is um, with Michael Molson. We just completed a, a very simple trellis in, um, in Napa Valley made out of Port Orford cedar. Port Orford cedar is a wood that I love that um, uh, is the same wood, Hinoki, that the Ize Shrine is um, built of in Japan. Um, this is actually the year, or last year was the year that they rebuilt the shrine, which they do every 20 years. Um, Port of Cedar comes from Oregon. It's, um, they, they don't have a lot of it, but it is harvested and is grown. Um, some of it is actually exported to Japan, but some of it is available. It's, it's an amazing wood, quite beautiful, quite aromatic. It's actually a cypress and quite good to work with. Um, so this trellis is part of a actually adaptive reuse of an of a existing house that Michael Maltzen, um redid for these um, clients of his and around which he then um, proposed this trellis. So we came up with this configuration. It's supported on these very skinny columns that are made up of two plates um, sandwiched together, oriented in different ways that act as vertical cantilevers to stabilize the structure. And then above that are these um, sinewy wood beams that are laminated together. Now when we, when we embark, and you can see they're, they're all different shapes, and I'll show you a little bit closer up, they meet together in rather complex ways. So a lot of fit up and variation, and I think the nice thing about this project is the more you look at it, the closer you get to it, the more you become, I think, um, caught up in the, 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 the various geometries of their intersection. The basic principle here is that you have these um, plates that are quite skinny and they're being braced laterally by the wood pieces. So I think in the end they're all working together, but there's this interplay and interdependency between the aluminum plates and the wood um, working together. These are some of the um, wood pieces being stored after they're fabricated. You see how they're flattened at the end and in the middle. There's also a pattern of thickness and thinness if you looked at this trellis from above where we're creating diagonal paths to make a horizontal truss. So some of them are thinner elements than others. These were made in similar fashion to any other glue lamp, but the interesting thing about this, if you look closely here, is they're actually made almost like out of Port Orford spaghetti. Um, Gordon Plume, who made these, who was up in um, Washington State, um, Gordon ended up slicing the wood up into little um, um, planes gluing those together and then slicing that again in the other direction to make the planes out of which these were made. So it's two operations that ends up with a wood lamination that isn't just layers of flat planes, but it's actually little strands um, uh, linked together. And you can, you can sort of see that um, in some of these sections. But it's quite, and then on top of that is a, a layer of Port Orford cedar. So this is them being assembled in the shop and then being, being installed. So here you see the, a, thick ver, a thick member and then a thin member. So there's a lot of these small variations throughout. Thank you very much. <laughs>